Welcome world to another episode of Nobody's a Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. This is the podcast where I interview people I find absolutely fascinating, and I believe you will too if you give them a chance. For our episode 49, the last interview episode of the year, I am interviewing my friend, the artist, Matt Goad. He has a really cool story that we'll be sharing, and Jarks' hot dog song of the week is featuring Kyle Reed's Dancing Alone. All right, let's get down to business. Our shout out for the week is actually coming from you, the listener. We were requested to shout out the Trolley Stop Record Shop, which is a music and movie store that is here in Oklahoma City at 1212 North Penn, Oklahoma City. The Trolley Stop Record Shop is your one-stop shop for vintage vinyl records, 78s, 45s, and albums. Again, you can find them at Trolley Stop Record Shop on Facebook. And finally, we want to mention one OKC.org. That's Our Neighborhood Empowered. They help children and teenagers develop the skills necessary to be able to succeed in the world. They are a nonprofit group that can almost always use a little bit more help. So please consider donating to Our Neighborhood Empowered, which is one OKC.org. This week's guest is Matt Goad. He has been in Oklahoma City for a good chunk of his life, and though I've known him mostly from his music, and that's how I got to know him in other areas, we actually spend a little bit more time talking about his graphic design specifically for the Will Rogers World Airport, and then we go into some things about music and art and just some other stuff, but I think you'll really enjoy this interview. Matt has done some fascinating things with his art, and here is our guest the artist Matt Goad. So I'm finally getting to interview the Matt Goad, like the coolest person I think I know in the world. So I don't know. That might be sad on you. I don't know. It very well might be. So I know that you've been doing a little bit of work at the airport and why don't we just start with that? Why don't you talk about that project and what's that, what's that been entailing? Well, the airport is uh, the Oklahoma City. It's called Will Rogers World Airport. And it is our our cute kind of little airport that they have decided they're going to add a giant wing to. And it's a $100 million expansion. And that's been in the works for um, a few years. Uh, Oklahoma City has a 1% for art. for So any public project, 1% 1% is dedicated to the, the art work in or around or whatever at the project. And that's for a number of reasons, but mainly to gain kind of a cultural equity and to kind of tell the story of the city. Uh, every, you know, every great metropolitan has a, a really, you know, um, immersive art experience with their public spaces. And uh, Oklahoma City is has been building on on theirs or ours um, for a few years now, and it's quite become quite an asset for them. So the Oklahoma, so the expansion of the airport at Will Rogers, um, when they came up with the design, they realized they wanted to do what's called terrazzo for the flooring, which most airports have. Our current airport has tiles. So when you kind of pull your luggage, rolling your luggage on the floor, it does that, 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 you know, that. Yeah, that's the part that I always love about going to the airport. Right. Well, other airports aren't like that. Terrazzo is perfectly smooth. The other thing about Terrazzo is it's infinite on what you can do, like with colors and with shapes. So it's a perfect art medium. So um, they're, they're building a second level in that wing that you'll be able to look down. So I think that was maybe one of the reasons they thought it would be great to do the floor in terrazzo and to have art in it. So um, they have another part of, of this where they have a, a big atrium area. They call it kind of the town square. And it's after you go through the TSA. And there's a second level called the mezzanine. And that's a ring of etched glass that you'll look through down onto the floor uh, level, the ground level. So uh, that also was part of the art project. So in 2018, they sent out what's called an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications. And um, I 
Someone mentioned that I should throw my hat in the ring on it because my work goes well, would, would translate well uh, to Terrazzo. Uh, my, my, my design kind of style is a lot of flat colors and shapes that interlocked. Um, I pride myself in this style being sort of culturally uh, like neutral enough to be liked by a lot of different people, young and old. So that was something that I kind of pitched as part of what I what I could bring to the project. Also, just showing examples of my work. Um, so they sent that out. Thirty five entries were submitted. I found out later, and I got a call around October of 2018 saying I became a finalist, one of five finalists out of the 35. So that blew my mind, and th that you know I figured would be probably the end of it. We had, I knew we'd have to go to, we had a mandatory meeting early January in uh, 2019. And that's when we met with the architects. We met with the um, um, airport. We met with the Terrazzo company and the glass company. And it was me and the other four artists. Uh, one was from London. Uh, the other three were from the States. One, there was only one other artist that was an Oklahoman, and I was the only Oklahoma City artist. So that was when we asked questions and everything. So the, the, then after that, that was like January 9th, February 25th was the date that we gave presentations, okay? So we had from January 9th to February 25th to put together what we're going to propose the art be, what it's going to look like. So... Um, uh, everyone in this was a very accomplished, you know, public artist. Uh, you know, the, uh, the other Oklahoman that was in the mix, he's got paint, uh, paintings in the Capitol building. I mean, you know, I was like the young punk here. Uh, so I didn't know, I have this graphic design pro like background and I'm, I know how to put together a visually stunning presentation. So I, I kind of had that in my back pocket and I, and I, and I have art, you know, is what I love the most. So I sort of just put my all into it. It was weirdly slow, my design business during the period. So I just went all out. I, I hired a friend who's an architect that helped me take my art and make it look like a photo in the space. He took the architecture drawings. And so uh, we did, we had that. I put together these books that had these aluminum covers that were etched and I just went all out on the presentation and I, I presented, um, I guess it was at 2.30 PM on February 25th. The presentation was about an hour. I was super nervous, but I had done my homework. So I felt pretty good about it. Um, anyway, I left and uh, as, as there was one of the gentlemen from the jury, there was a jury of 12 that were from the city, the architects and the airport and maybe some other kind of um, consultants that were on the jury. Um, I made 15 of these presentation folders. Each one was a unique kind of thing, slightly different, kind of like as an art piece. So uh, so anyway, one of the guys walked me to the elevator when I was done. And he shook my hand, goes, uh, good job. We're going to let uh, the winner know today. And then we're going to let the uh, we're going to let the other the other um, submittees know the rest of the week or this tomorrow or the next day. So, you know, me naturally, I was like, great, I'm going to go to bed tonight and not know, you know, so, <laughs> so I go back to my studio and I sit down and mom's on Facebook going, how'd it go, you know, and I said, I think it went pretty well. By the way, we built a model too. We built like a ball at a balsa with the guy, wow. the architect friend. It was like, so you really did go all out on you went every all, single facet. All That's out, awesome. All out. And, uh, um, so anyway, I was talking to mom. I'd only been back at the studio about two hours and I got a, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. So uh, anyway, I answered it and it was, it was Randy with the city. And he said, Matt, um, I was just calling to let you know that you need to get up here and get this model the hell out of here. Um, and I was just kind of taken off guard. And then I hear a, a room full of laughter. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I bet. On, I'm on speakerphone and then it hits me. They're about to tell me I won. 
And then that's what happened next. They said, we'd like to congratulate you. You were, sele you were selected unanimously for the airport art for the expansion. So I was, I was just lost in emotion. They walked, they kind of went around the room, each one talking about things they liked. And I get almost misty eyed thinking about it because it's such a life changing thing for me. I mean, to have something on this grand a scale be permanent, you know, I've done, I've done murals and stuff like that. I've done a lot of paintings and stuff for people. I've done, you know, back in graphic design, I used to do a lot of illustration work and, you know, it might be in a magazine, which would be so awesome and exciting, but you know, that magazine's good for whatever a month, this thing is like permanent. So so it's scary and and awesome all at the same time. So well, that's that's a huge honor. I mean, it's I mean, I've seen your art for the past goodness, 8 years or so and things that you've done and you I always love your art. I have your Oklahoma mural that you have. It's still post it's in my office and I cool. love looking at it every day and but like you said at that scale, that is just absolutely amazing that um, not only did you get picked from all these world renowned artists that you get to represent the Oklahoma city brand at the Oklahoma city airport. That's really cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm still completely humbled and honored by it all. So, um, it was, it's been a weird journey. We went through a lot of, we went through a lot of, uh, ch some changes to the design. Um, I had, uh, I'll give you a little quick background on that. That was a big deal. Um, because I had the land run and then it, first of all, my, my project, it's called OKC connected and like the C and OKC is the first letter of the word connected. So it's like one kind of unit, OKC connected. And, um, the whole idea was it's a connection from past to present, um, from actually past, ancient past to 1889 when the city was founded to present. And then a connection of uh, earth to sky and then a connection of Oklahoma City to the world. So um, my connection of uh, the past was the land run. Um, and I had a few, pro uh, the, m much of the lobby, the land run was a prominent theme in the narrative. Well, someone contacted me about, I don't know, six months later, the whole thing was on the cover of the Oklahoman and was on OKC Talk and a bunch of people were able to see it. Well, I had a woman that uh, um, is in the arts world in Oklahoma. She's from New York. She contacted me and said, I'd like to go to lunch with you and talk about some stuff. So we went to lunch and she said, I'm not sure if you know this, but the land run is a painful, it's a painful event for a lot of Native Americans. And um, this could become something that could be potentially controversial or something in some way. Um, you know, this was all happening and it still is, I guess, with the Confederate statues and things in, in the South. Uh, and I don't know if this is equivalent of that, but um, I met with a lot of people over the course of the next couple of weeks. I met with the people at the Native American Cultural Center. I met with Bob Blackburn. And then I met with uh, Paul Moore. Paul Moore is a sculptor and he did the, the land run sculptures down by the Boathouse District. Um, also, Paul Moore happens to be a Muskogee, right? He's so, so he's, and his sculpture, he told me that that series took him 18 years and they're monumental. If you see him, you're like, wow. I mean, you, you totally can see how this took someone 18 years. Well, you know, he, he expressed some frustration because he felt like, the city in a way was, well, I don't know. He just felt like he, that, that it was sad that, I don't know. I don't know how to say this. I guess he was unhappy with the way the history of the land run and his sculptures were being vilified in a way. Right. So I asked it. So I basically, you know, we had lunch and he, so what would you do if you were me? He said, I would make it, I would make it. I would change it basically. If he were me, he would, I would change it. So, so I approached the city with this and I said, guys, we need to change my lobby narrative. So, and I explained by then I kind of had the idea what I wanted to do. We called a special meeting with the airport director and we kept the initial like 
composition and the design and a lot of the elements, but I changed much of the uh, much of the um, narrative of the land run. I changed into a uh, a sort of a man man. It's a, there's a bow and an arrow shooting in the air toward the sun, and it's kind of a it's it's kind of a metaphor for man um, man uh, wanting flight, I guess. Uh, and there's birds, so it's like inspiration from nature to fly. So um, so that's that story. So this whole year that a bunch of stuff has happened um, last well. Much in 2019 and then now 2020 is almost over with. COVID's been awful. Uh, I had to go back and forth with to the Terrazzo company in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina to kind of figure out what the color mixtures were. I mean, that could be a podcast in and of itself. That was a major deal. So all this planning, you know, happens and has gone on and gone on and gone on. And then about two weeks ago, they come in and they go, okay, we got the lobby divider strips installed. So I got to go see for the very first time what it's going to look like in person. Basically, you see it outlined anyway. So, um, and in two weeks, they have that entire lobby now poured with terrazzo colors. So basically, terrazzo, you pour these colors in, and then they grind it and polish it. So it's it's kind of sloppy looking when they first pour it in. But once it's ground and polished, it, it will be super clean and crisp and beautiful. And they're going to do that in January. So it's been all this planning and everything, and it all happens really quick, you know, it seems like. So yeah, in uh, spring, it's supposed to be finished. And hopefully by then, we'll have a... Um, a vaccine or a few vaccines going to where we can all meet and look at the airport and hug each other. I'd like to see that happen. Yeah, that'd be great. I listened to the episode that you did with, uh, um, this is Oklahoma and brilliant. Uh, it goes into a lot of detail on things that I would have never thought to ask. So that's the good news for me, at least. One of the things that I just think is a really cool part of your story is how you kind of you've had this weird relationship with art, uh, maybe specifically Oklahoma Christian that you went to college there. Um, you didn't finish there, but then now you're over there teaching people how to do art. In fact, I've had several friends that are like, Oh yeah, I know Matt Goad. He taught me at OC. And I was like, wait a minute, Matt's teaching there. That's, and uh, why don't you tell a little bit your history of OC kind of just your relationship with it through uh, your dad and to where you are now, or if you're with it now. Uh, yeah, well, I grew, I grew up a preacher's kid. My dad's a Church of Christ preacher, and I was always the artist in the family. And um, I had a, I lived in Arizona before we we moved all over the states growing up. But I lived in Arizona in junior high and high school. And when I was gonna get into college, I was kind of looking at what I was good at, and it really was just art. And someone said, well, they had this graphic design. Uh, career you could get into and you know make a living at it but you're not going to make much money <laughs> that was like one of the things I found out um, well I was doing research and my folks my, my my mainly my grandparents they wanted me to go to a Christian college so it had just so happened one of my best friends had gone to Oklahoma Christian the year prior on a soccer scholarship and he was like going back. So I was like, well, man, maybe I could, maybe we could check this out. So um, my parents had divorced actually two years prior to all this, but I'll get back to that. So anyway, I come to school, graphic design, I get into it. First few years, I was a little bit um, misguided on my priorities. I didn't really put too much emphasis on school. It was mainly girls and, <laughs> and other stuff. So uh, anyway, I guess that's my relationship with Oklahoma Christian. I ended up dropping out. I ended up going back to school a couple of years later at UCO and graduating there. By then I was focused, you know, and I had an internship and that was a paid internship at a small studio downtown. This is in the early 90s. So um, early to mid 90s. So uh yeah, that's, that's really the, the extent of my relationship. So in about 2005, the head of the department, by then I'm like, you know, um, a local creative director, graphic designer, 
uh, Michael O'Keefe, who was head in the department up at Oklahoma Christian, asked me to do, asked me to adjunct, teach a few classes. And it was something I did for about three or four years. I do a semester here, a semester there. And, uh, and that's been it really. Um, I love teaching and, you know, mentoring or whatever, in whatever way I can. I don't know if I'm good at it, but I, uh, I definitely enjoyed that, but I, as, you know, now I just didn't, I don't have the time to do it. They come, they, you know, I'll do lectures and, and they'll do student tours in my studio, but since COVID, you know, we've just done it all like this on Zoom, so. I have gotten the pleasure of seeing a couple of your shows. One was actually at OC a few years ago, and I, because I think you were one, the featured artist, but there was a couple other people showcasing their art as well but there was a lot of your art, but, um, and then I got to see, uh, you did some, an art presentation at the Myriad Gardens and that was really cool to get to see like your three monkeys. Uh, that's my, probably my favorite. Yeah, I did a, I did uh, a picture whole that you've done. show on, uh, on space monkeys. <laughs> and I still have the shirt. I have one of the shirts that you had for that. I, I love that one. Um, but the real reason why I know you is from your music and I went to a concert back in January of 2013 wow. and saw this really interesting Mumford and, Fun Mumford and Sons wannabe band that brought all the people to the yard. But then when they left, you guys were there. And I think there were six of us still in the audience at that point because it's like two o'clock in the morning at a, on a Thursday morning That's or something. Right. <laughs> um, but then I heard Karma Ride and followed that up. I think you followed that up with... Uh, blow up the moon and i just fell in love with your band at that point and i know it's anyway uh so tell me about the your journey with music and how you did you start this at the same time with art or did you kind of go back and forth because you're an excellent guitarist and great song oh, thanks it's been one of those things the total labor of love like i don't know i feel like i put way more effort into music <clears throat> personally than than art Art's just sort of, I've gotten feedback from and, and people paid me for, but music, it, it's always been like, it's impossible. And I guess that's just probably the way it is with 99.9% .9 of all kids that play music. But, you know, I grew up in a musical family. Both of my folks play instruments. They were very, we were always sang in church. We always had a guitar and a piano in the house. So, uh, but I never played music or played an instrument until I was about 10 or 11. Other than I picked up, you know, a few chords from my dad on our acoustic guitar. Um, and, but when I was 10 or 11, I, I started getting into <clears throat> rock and roll and stuff. And I really wanted to learn guitar. And I, I had a paper route saved up for my first electric. Mom paid for lessons when I was 12 and 13. And, uh, you know, I didn't really start writing songs till I was later on in high school. I was in a band in high school and they were horrible songs, but, uh, but aren't then, they always, the first ones are always horrible, but we think they're I, great at the time. Yeah. I mean, I thought they were awesome. And then in college, in college, I met this guy who became my roommate and we're still really good friends. His name is Richard York. And he and I started playing a lot together and, uh, um, fast forward a couple years after that, I had, a, I had started a band and, uh, with a guy named Matt Johnson who played bass and, and eventually Rich ended up moving near me. Um, and we started hanging out every night and before you know it, we were writing a song almost every day. So Richard and I wrote a ton of songs like between like 92 and 96 or seven we wrote quite a few songs and recorded some of them. And we went under a few different names then. We were called Big Backyard Chick. But in this time frame, this was in my early 20s, I was, we were really confident on our songwriting. We, we put a ton of time into it and we would geek out on it to such a level that we just knew we were gonna be famous, you know? <laughs> so um, anyway, that, that's been, I don't know if I've even addressed the question, but. That, big, that band we had originally was called Big Backyard, then later it was Chick, and later it was 21st Century Dream, and we had this name 
in between that we never were billed under when we played live, but it was American Boyfriends. And we always liked that name. Um, so I guess it was about 1998 because I had stopped. I joined another band for a little tiny bit called the Starlight Minutes local band. And then that didn't last very long. And and then Richard and I said, let's let's revive this. And by then, Matt had been playing in the, this band, the Chainsaw Kittens, who were pretty popular locally. Yeah, yeah, the, I remember them. The drummer of that band, who I was friends with, his name was Eric Harmon. And he's like the best drummer in Oklahoma, in, in my opinion, back then. You know? Definitely in the top two or three. So, um, Rick, so Matt calls me, he goes, Hey, Eric's in if you, if you know, we want. So next thing you know, I've got me and Richard, Eric and Matt. And it's like, it's like the dream. And we, we put together, um, our first album was in 2001 full on album with, uh, with Carl Ambert in Norman, Oklahoma. We just put that on Spotify. It's called what love can be. It's under American boyfriends with an S. There's another, there's another American boyfriend without an S I noticed. Um, and actually right now we're working on all, all the songs we never did release. We recorded an album that never was put out. Um, and uh, Eric unfortunately passed away in 2017. So we're kind of doing this as a tribute to him. Um, but also just to have it out there for prosperity or whatever. Uh, is that the word pros? Anyway, I can't think of the word posterity. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> so, um, so around that time, I met my my ex wife. This was in two thousand and maybe three. I got married. So I guess by then it was like okay, mission accomplished with the band. I found the girl. So so I just kind of stopped making music there for a while in the two thousands, and it wasn't until about two thousand and ten. 2009 that some friends of mine were just like let's start a band and that was what became feel specters so um feel specters we did three records uh the first one was with well every record was with a different there was alan and i on all three but we had two other people that were that were different on the three records so um so yeah that's the story what else about music i don't know i like I always like an idea of like a lyric, like blow up the moon. There was a, there's a Mr. Show skit called blow up the moon. And it's about these scientists that they discover this power to blow up the moon and they never really question why. And they, they hire this or they, they get this uh, monkey that knows sign language. They, they get him to press the button. Cause he's the grandson of the first monkey that went up into space or whatever. So the monkey asks the scientists, why? Why are we blowing up the moon? And it frustrates the scientists. Anyway, I thought it was a fun idea for the for a song. So I wrote, I wrote Blow Up the Moon. Um, and then, so all songs are kind of like that. But a lot of times they'll start with a lyric. Typically they do. They start with a lyric idea. And then they'll move into uh, the music from there. But sometimes the music will just tell me what the lyrics are and vice versa. So the first two albums in particular of Phil Spector's, you do this really cool thing of where you have really these dark and twisted lyrics, but it's so positive and happy that most of the songs, like you're, you're talking about some pretty deep stuff, but it's usually like, you know, Karma Ride's a great example talking about um, death kind of coming back to bite you, but it, it's a, uh, it's this kind of poppy. Uh, it's one of the three songs that whenever I try to introduce people to Phil Spector's, I always, that's one of the songs I have them, I play. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, oh. you know, I, I can just go through like Catacomb. Again, it's this really um, guitar driven song, but it's really a kind of a darker song. And I, were you just in bad spots or were you just like, hey, I know there's other people that have depression and this is a good thing to listen to at the time? No, it's just like a monster movie. I like writing sometimes about a, a kind of, I don't know, I like scary movies and I, I've, I've always liked Edgar Allan Poe, which inspired me on Catacomb. And I mean, I had, a, I had a girlfriend that was like, what's this about? And I wrote this song called Cold Woman Blue. And it's creepy, you know, but it's not me saying, it's not like me expressing, it's just a story that I thought was kind of fun or interesting. And 
and kind of creepy in a fun way, you know? Um, so that's what that is. I, sometimes the songs are deep, meaningful songs, uh, but sometimes they're just fun stories that I was inspired to write, you know? Yeah, Cold Woman Blue is one of my friend's favorite songs. That is your his absolute favorite song that you guys ever did. And we got you to play it one time live. We could never get you to do it again. Not you. You were actually, yeah, let's do it. And everybody else was like, no, no. <laughs> we used to play it a lot on that first, I think it's on the first record. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's the last um, song. But the way it starts off with the little kind of the, scree- the screechy kind of uh-huh, shrill sound yeah. and uh then of course the second album i got to see you perform a lot of those songs when after you'd written them and i got to see some of the original iterations of those songs so of course that's my favorite album of all time <laughs> and everybody on the show knows i love jarvix but uh, you guys since you're technically not together anymore then you're my favorite former band yeah, but, right. <laughs> uh, but meet your double is my favorite song i think you guys ever written i think it could be the opening credits for almost any tv show that's got a like a mystery or a crime scene kind of thing uh, uh, did you ever do you remember when i made those videos for you of like taking tv shows yeah. and uh, matching it to you yeah. i know i'm weirdo <laughs> like that <laughs> oh i love it love, love you mike you're awesome um uh, <laughs> uh, so let's see and i, I know i so I understand more about how to write lyrics because I've, I've failed multiple times at trying to write songs with lyrics and stuff. And then I actually heard a song the other day that around the time I started writing songs, I was like, oh my goodness, I completely copied this song without realizing I copied it. Um, and, but I heard it and I went back and listened to my original version of the song. I was like, oh my goodness, I stole this so horribly without realizing it. And how do you come up with like guitar licks and like the like chords and stuff, I get that. But how do you come up with like the med the melodies and the the cool little riffs that you do that just you know make me want to watch you forever? Uh, I, I I don't know. It's almost like once the song gets started, it's almost like the song's telling you what to do. Like, and you gotta you gotta hear it, you gotta listen, and hear what needs to happen. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, it's like and. It, and yeah, I, I don't know if if this is uh maybe this has been done the same exact song and I just kind of heard it and I'm mimicking it. I don't know that anyone can really guarantee that they know that. It's funny. Just this morning I saw Paul McCartney on um, the CBS Sunday Morning and he was talking about yet the song yesterday. He said he dreamt it and he woke up in the morning and he had the tune and he kind of wrote it out. And he said he didn't believe he he thought he was just he had heard it somewhere. And uh, he said for two weeks, he didn't think he wrote it. He thought maybe it came from West Side Story or something. And everyone was like, no, I've never heard that before. So he ended up saying, well, yeah, I wrote it. then." <laughs> so That's anyway, awesome. I'm, I'm not by any means comparing myself to Paul McCartney. I, but you should. I'm, you should. You're one of my favorite <laughs> songwriters. He is, too. So. <laughs> Well, that's, that's kind of, yeah, I don't know, on the riffs, like, there's just, you know, we need something right here, you know, okay, this pieces those parts together a little bit, um, you know, so I guess that's it. <laughs> of course, you have to give a simple answer to that, right? <laughs> you just got to hear it and then follow through with it, you know, that's right. all. <laughs> it's easy, just just do it for uh, 30 plus years and it'll eventually come it's to you, It's like right? the song tells you what to do, but you got to hear it, you know? And you got to work on it. Um, so, and there's a point where if I work too much on a song, I'm, I'm bored and I'll just throw it, I'll throw, not throw it out, but just put it down. And I've got a couple of songs that are 25 years old that I still know, but I never did finish them. And then I have other songs I've finished in five, 10, 15 minutes, you know? So you never know. I mean, and I go through spurts, like sometimes, like I haven't even picked up, I picked up my guitar the other day, but I didn't, I hadn't been p- picking it up much this year, which is silly because of COVID, I've had a lot of time, but, uh, but last year, 2019, I wrote like, I don't know, 30 songs. So it's just kind of comes in, comes in spurts here. Now, one of the other things that you are pretty big advocate for is 
saving really cool looking architecture buildings in Oklahoma City and the metro and stuff. Um, or I say saving that you're on the committees and stuff. And I always see, I, I care more about Oklahoma architecture because of what you posted on Instagram and Facebook, but like the uh, gold civic center, I call it civic center. That's what it makes me think of the gold bank, gold dome. Gold um, dome. Yeah. And then uh, the one church that's over there off of uh, 36th. <laughs> and I know there's some other buildings and stuff that you and a group of people have been advocates for to keep and stuff. What kind of got you into that um, advocacy? Well, it's, it's just design. It goes back to design. I, I started to fall in love with mid-century modern stuff and when, in college. And the guy I worked for, the internship I had, he showed me, he went first studio, you know, where I worked, I, I was sitting in an Eames chair, Charles Eames, E-A-M-E-S, Charles and Ray Eames. And I discovered them and then you know, one thing led to another and I, all of a sudden I'm looking around Oklahoma City in my 20s going, oh my gosh, there's so much great stuff here. So about 2005 or so when I was in my 30s and married, we realized we have a bunch of friends that have these houses that are kind of mid-century modern and that turned into dinner party, cocktail parties and then we came up Someone came up with the name. I think it was my friend Don Harth, who was one of these couples. And she came up with the name. Let's start a little club, Oki Mod Squad. So then that turned into, when Facebook came around, a little Facebook group we started. Well, um, eventually, that now that has over 8,000 members or whatever on Facebook. And really the catalyst between us just being fans to being adver- advocates to saving these structures that were in jeopardy of being torn down was a woman named Lynn Rostichel. And when she joined Oki Mod Squad, we became like a legitimate operation because she had all this knowledge and history. And her grandfather was an architect that designed the Church of Tomorrow there at 36th and Walker. And um, she was just a, a wealth, a library of knowledge. And if you go to Oki Mod, um, okcmod.com you can see our website everything that's anything on on the um, blogs on the history of the library on there is all from lynn lynn passed away in in 2018 just a total heart wrencher so the whole thing has not been the same and it never will be um we're not like i mean we're not like organized like oh well at least i'm not in it like as an organized uh, advocate, but but whenever things went to the city council, you know, we were there and we were we work with the Oklahoma City Foundation for Architecture and they they are kind of taking over the reins of it, but um, I'm just passionate about it. And I used to be a lot more passionate, but after watching, um, you know, so many things like, like Stage Center be torn down and that bank at May and Northwest Expressway, legendary some legendary architects were torn down i just the wind just got knocked out of my sails and i realized some of this private private property you know people have the right to tear it down i just think that they should be encouraged not to because it creates a you know a cultural um sort of uh equity in our in our history of a city you know it's not just mid-century modern it's anything like old art deco you know Oklahoma City went through this thing called urban renewal. And this was in, I guess, the 60s, 70s. And they hired this famous architect to come in and he redesigned the downtown. And that required them to just raise a ton of buildings. So um, after that, I guess they ran out of money. So they just tore all these buildings down and then never did anything. So Oklahoma City, you know, lost a lot of great stuff that they look, we look back on now as what a shame, but you know, that's how I feel it's still happening in some regards. So yeah, I'm just passionate about it um, is, is the only reason, you know, I love design, um, all kinds of design, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I hate to see some really unique, awesome, structure torn down and then a Walgreens built there, you know, right? Nothing, or Walmart or whatever, nothing against them is, but you know, find another lot. I mean, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's, so. it's, it's living history. That's no, now it's just ancient history as soon as it gets removed. Yeah, you know, and I, anyway. Um, another thing that I know that you're pretty passionate about is Volkswagen and, or at least a specific Volkswagen <laughs> and, oh, all uh, of them, really. and bikes and, and stuff. And was that just also because of design or did you read art, uh, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and then just like, Oh man, I'm a motorcycler for life now. Or how'd you go into that? I've always been mixed. I mean, I used to have a motorcycle in college. I did read that in, in high school or college, but but that wasn't it. I got into German stuff. Like I had a Volkswagen bus in co- in high school, in college. And I had an old vintage BMW in high school. And all of this is like, you know, working at a, working the pizza oven at a pizza place. I mean, that was my income back then. So you could buy that stuff for cheap back then though, in the eighties. And now you can't even buy them. And so they're so valuable, but the Volkswagen thing just happened uh, because my neighbor, I mean, I've always had a love for them, but my Beetle, which is almost in a way, it's just like part of who I am. It, it was uh, my neighbors had it in their garage and it had just been in there for like, well, 45 years or whatever in their garage. They bought it in Germany. They, they shipped it over and they, you know, they, they moved it into this garage in Edgemere and they drove it around in the sixties, I think in the seventies too, but I think much of the eighties, nineties, and part of the two thousands have just sat in that garage and uh, I convinced them to sell it to me. So yeah, um, I am very fascinated by history and uh, it's so ironic to me that the, that the, the, the car that's like the symbol of peace and love in the sixties was actually designed by the Nazis. So that's always been a fascination of mine. And, um, and they're so cute and adorable. It's such the irony in that, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely love the design of, um, the, of the Beetle. There was a point where we had like, we had three cars and a motorcycle and everything was broken down with the Beetle. You know, because everything in it is so simple. You almost can't break it. And it's so easy to fix, you know, it doesn't have all the creature comforts, you know, like heated seats or uh, automatic door locks or anything, but, but it does. Uh, it Wait, does there's get... cars without automatic door locks. <laughs> <Right>. What? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it gets you from point A to point B and it's fun, you know, and I drive it anytime it's nice. I'll, I'll get it out. I actually was thinking about that today. It's looking pretty nice out. Um, well, I'm just, uh, I was thinking about this. I'm like, uh, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I'm like a big kid that has a bunch, that has a cl- cool clubhouse with toys. I don't really, I don't have kids. I kind of wanted them. I didn't know I did um, until later, but then, but that just never happened. And, uh, you know, I try to bring, I try to be a positive force in some way through art. And things I don't really uh, I don't know how else to put it other yeah um, I love design and I love art and I try to support other artists and artists friends and design and I'm a lucky I'm a lucky kid you know that's getting to whatever play with my toys at 50. <laughs> well one of the things I, I do know that this is I won't say like you're a progenerator for my podcast but you are one of the people that taught me that people in the same field aren't necessarily your competitors because every single time I saw you take the stage with Phil Spector's, it didn't matter who was playing with you guys. Sometimes the bands might not have been that talented or that organized, but you were always the most generous person um, for the people that preceded you and the people that would come after you uh, and proceeded you, I guess, preceded and proceeded. And you were always so generous. And then, um, if your set was over, you'd go grab a PBT. Uh, I can't PBR. say anymore. Whatever. Yeah, yeah PBR. <laughs> I was going to say PBT. Uh, you'd grab a PBR, and, and then you'd get right on the front row and be rocking out to the bands that were playing. And that was such an encouragement for me of not always looking at people that are doing the same thing as you as being someone that you're competing with, that it's uh, that you really did share that love that you're talking about, trying to support other artists and stuff. And I was able to be exposed to a lot of – great music and a lot of great artwork because of um, 
you having that attitude. So I didn't just come to see the Phil Spectres. I mean, first it was what I came for, but then I started coming earlier to see the other bands. And if you guys weren't the last one on the slate, I'd stay later to see the bands that followed you guys. And that's, um, and you and your, I know, I and mean, you weren't even the reason why I went to go see Phil Spectres is because of the bassist, <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. because I worked with her and, um, and I was just going out to, you know, support my friend and like, we're never planning on coming back. And, um, but then I just kind of, and I, I mean, again, you know, I mean this, like not in a too weird way, a little bit weird way, but I'm completely in love with everything that you do and just, um, always love the art that you bring out, whatever it's through music or it's through visual. Um, even your mind, um, is just one of those things that's, you know, beautiful in so many different ways because you look at things in a different way and, one of the things that I, my goal with this podcast is to basically uh, collect the stories of people that I find fascinating and to hopefully share those and that other people will find the same things. Well, my brand is supporting other people and yeah. you were a very good model for me to be able to support people that um, both that do the things I do and things that I don't do. And I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you, Mike. You've been a really great friend and just support i mean you don't get a lot of that people reacting po so positively the way you have with me certainly into my music you know but uh um it's it's not easy creating things you know and being happy with them and for me it's it can be torturous it's like labor it's like li like giving birth you know it's just it's a painful thing so to get feedback that's positive is so awesome. And um, thank you for that. So I try to do that, you know, to, to other people that create, because even if I don't think it's very good, it took effort. And I know it came from some place that took, took some, something from them. And putting yourself out there, it's like, it's a scary proposition, you know? Um, so I, I admire people that do it. Uh, and I, I, I want to support, support them and congratulate them or whatever, give them props for just even just doing it, you know? You, you are so talented and I don't mean that like that you're necessarily better than everybody else. I like a lot of the, what you do. Um, there's very few things I've seen or heard from you that I haven't enjoyed, but, um, I'm glad that other people do recognize your talent and I'm glad that the city of Oklahoma city and the airport, Will Rogers airport were able to see what so many other people have seen in you and that they're able to put you on a, a more visible permanent stage. Yeah, that just, that, that's just beyond an honor and I'm very humbled and I have so many people to thank going way back just that encouraged me and, you know, my mom and, everyone that's ever been you know teachers i have a long list of teachers that were really important to me and and uh yeah i'm so fortunate i can't even can't even believe it um so thank you mike thanks for letting me tell a bit of my story Hot dog. Hey listeners, it's Jarvix again with my hot dog song of the week. New Year's Day is coming up, so I thought it would be fitting to share what seems to be a fresh New Year's classic from the central Oklahoma folk music world. The song is called Dancing Alone, and it's by local music jack of all trades, Kyle Reed. Kyle is primarily known for his throwback swing style, which comes through in his full band projects with the low swing and chariots. He's also an accomplished soloist, and that's still just the tip of his iceberg. He humbly wears less recognized but just as praiseworthy roles like session musician, studio producer, and even cigar box guitar maker. His song Dancing Alone has been written for a while, but he didn't officially put out his own recording of it until his 2019 album Love and Trust in the Age of St. Sugar Bridges. It's actually one of at least three recordings of the song that I'm aware of, however. One appears in 2017 on Andy Adams's Back to Square One, which he reimagines as a duet with Carter Sampson. Another appears on a brand new album called, actually, Dancing Alone by Rigby Summer. 
Each has their own take on the tune, applying their style while keeping the heart of the song, which I think is a fine watermark of a well-written song. The moment captured in Dancing Alone is a New Year's Eve party where, you guessed it, our narrator is Dancing Alone. Kyle Reed's version has a certain mosey to it, enough pep to convey the festivities, but enough droll to feel his slumpy demeanor which is probably further exacerbated by the traditional excess of holiday booze. Without the person who he really wants to share the evening with, the wind is out of his sails. It's a lot like when you have a birthday balloon, but after a few days it starts to go flat and doesn't quite lay dead on the floor yet, but it just hovers about halfway from the ceiling. At least, that's what Kyle's version reminds me of. I would put it in the same league as dour holiday tunes like Blue Christmas and Christmas in Jail, except I like this one better. There's something about Kyle Reed's special roll with the punches tone that keeps it from being a total sulk. It's catchy and fun, and with its swing guitar and old-fashioned trumpeting, it represents the ideology of the blues more than quite a few modern blues songs ever even managed to touch. New Year's, like all holidays, is filled with tradition. Whether it's the countdown to the Times Square ball drop, the drunken partying, the eating of various foods for good luck, or the midnight kiss. In regard to that last one, though, while the kiss may be a reminder for single people that they don't have a date, that doesn't mean they can't dance the night away, even if it is alone. The music, after all, is no respecter of persons. Here is Dancing Alone by Kyle Reed. Well, I'm dancing alone at a happening place to all the anxiety on the last evening of the year. A drink in my hand. Where I'd be smiling, I'd be smiling if you were here. But maybe this time next year, I won't be dancing alone. Yeah, maybe this time next year, I could be taking you home. Instead of dancing alone. To all the anxiety on the last evening of the year. Come on, hey.
Thank you to Matt Goad. You can find him on his website, mattgoad.com, and Kyle Reed at kylereedmusic.com. The shout out is the Trolley Stop Music Shop. And you can find them on Facebook. And thank you, Jarvix and 10kc.org. I hope you've enjoyed this first set of podcast of interviews and please stay tuned to next year we'll start it off with dan wade of the will of randy nobody is a nobody and that means you until next time